uh, I've made, I made tons of notes. Um, it was both interesting and fun, uh, but also educational. If you remember yesterday morning when Tyler and Andy started, they said, do you want uh, entertainment or do you want uh, education? And uh, we got both of those in both occasions. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of try to pull together or just remember together uh, what we've experienced in the last, uh, the last couple of days. And again, we learn along with you when we do this. Uh, still like the theme. Uh, that we came up with. It seemed like it worked, uh, that we were able to have a lot of content around this. And just to take you back a long, 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 long time ago, this was yesterday morning, and uh, we've had uh, some uh, experiences with a number of companies, a number of learning sessions, which I wish, uh, you know, wish we could all go to all of those. Um, and then we've had the time that we've been together here, and then this, uh, this morning and ending up today. Of course, you could just look at your program or you could search your memory banks. But when all of this happens in such a short amount of time, it's amazing how you just forget the things that we've heard about. We heard about transforming the culture from our friends at Brinks. People often say it's all about the people, all about the culture. And this is what uh, Brinks talked to us about. A lean culture can transform your company, improve the business results, and inspire employees. And then our uh, last plenary, I think it was the last one, right, from American, uh, American Family, uh, pointed out that we are the culture, not to get confused, not to use culture as an excuse. The, it can be this big amorphous thing. The guy that invented this uh, term and concept of organizational culture, Edgar Schein, himself says, don't go about trying to change your culture by attacking the culture directly. That's a very difficult thing to do. Understand your aim, the task, the reason we all come together, the purpose we're together, let that be the thing that focuses you to enable you then to become the kind of culture that you want. Now, I think this is, says that very well. And I often see people doing exactly what uh, he suggests, that to say we cannot act because of the culture, is saying we're not willing to act. It's a choice, absolutely a choice. Culture is our own choice. And it's a personal choice, and there's personal change involved. And this was the young Tyler Schilling. I had never seen photos of the young Tyler Schilling, where he had to go through some tremendous change, if you recall his story, uh, from being the answer man. He's a very, very, very smart individual. I know him. So he probably does have a lot of answers. But he eventually learned that he didn't really have the answers that were out there, that he needed to work with the people in the organization to develop them and to stop being the answer man. Uh, I know from stories uh, that he's told before that he struggled with that, but he managed to work through it. That was a cultural change of his own, a personal change. Um, and then yesterday, uh, also, was that yesterday? Uh, again, it all starts to run together, right? Uh, Mahesh from Sri Lanka came all the way from Sri Lanka to be with us. It's a personal change. He had his personal transformation. He went to Toyota City uh, 10 or 15 years ago. It changed his life, and that allowed him to save his company. And he's grown his company tremendously. Every time I talk to him, they have another five or 10,000 employees. The opportunity... That, that we have as employers to transform our businesses by investing in our people. And he's done that. He's done that. And you may recall that he showed this very, very quickly. And it looked like just a typical story, a company, okay, they're in, they're in a lot of countries, fine. They're growing, they're in a lot of countries, great. What he didn't emphasize as much as he might have was some of the places that he has chosen to build his factories and to give jobs. The Civil War in his country lasted two, about three decades. It, destroyed, it, it was devastating. Here we are in Tennessee, part of the South. There was a Civil War we had here about, a, when was that, 150 years ago? Uh, they had one just a few years ago. And he chose as soon as he could to build factories in the North that had been devastated. He gave jobs to women who desperately needed some kind of income. He goes and walks those factory floors. We talk about leaders and they're, to, you know, they're working on strategic things. Someone else, you know, knows better that they know how to go to the, go to the, the worry about the Gemba. Was it Steve on the panel that just said that when he had the Dora company, that, yeah, he was the cheerleader for Lee and said, that's great, you guys are doing that, you do that more, that's really, really good. But he didn't really think it was his job. Mahesh, now that he has a company of over a billion dollars, close to 100,000 employees, scattered in 60 countries, he'll go to a factory and spend three hours walking the floor. He told me when he went to that factory in the north of Sri Lanka recently, a woman stopped him at the third hour while he's walking the floor just to explain to him, to thank him, that she now finally has a roof over her head. 
her family didn't have a roof. They, had, should they now have an income and they have, are able to feed themselves. You can't really see that map very well, but I think you have copies or you can get, yeah, yeah we have all the materials you, that you can download or available in some way. But if you look, there's a little red dot in the Caribbean. In Haiti. Why is a guy with an apparel company in Sri Lanka building a factory in Haiti? He doesn't have to build a factory in Haiti. So all the great employers in this room, how many of us are building a factory in Haiti? He's doing that because he can provide jobs. He doesn't need to go there to build an apparel factory. He's going to have 15, 1,500 employees there. Incredible. He's thinking beyond just what he has to do for his company. And Kiami's story today, I have to say, you know, like Jim said, we've been doing this. Jim has for a very, very long time. I have as well. I don't know how, don't know how many conferences I've been to, link conferences, some that we've organized ourselves, some by other people. I think I, think I may have a candidate for my favorite, uh, you know, summit presentation of all time. Uh, personal in inspiration, right, the change that he's gone through, the things that he's done. Tremendous story. And Jim mentioned, but this is something, this is why we exist. You know, we don't, we don't usually, I don't know if we do or not. We try not to advertise ourselves a lot. We lead with content. We're not for profit. Uh, we're small. Sometimes we make money. Sometimes we don't. But we've done, but with Alice's lead, we've, uh, and, and Eric also, and some of us being involved. Alice and I first went to, to, to Lynn a couple years ago, and Alice gives me credit for saying, make Lynn our, you know, your best friend. Now, we decided together we're going to make Lynn our best friend. We wanted to help. It's a pro bono. Sometimes we're losing money, but we did that for free. Because that's the reason we exist. If we don't do that kind of thing, we don't, need to, we, we don't need to do what we do. And I couldn't feel more proud than to see that that's having a bearing fruit uh, in the form of what we heard about today from Kiyami. Sorry if I'm getting a little bit emotional. And so you told us that we wanted to think about engagement as we think about what it means to be an employer. So I'm going to ask you to help to think this through together. I'm, I have a proposal here, I have a suggestion. I wrote something about this a couple months ago. Maybe you saw this. I'm gonna suggest that a job has three parts. What is a job? Jim has said and I've said and we've said that it starts with the work. So uh, I don't know, we all like to say it's all about the people. Not every, I mean, every presentation probably said it's all about the people. I don't know, I'm not sure what that means. You know, it starts with the work. We don't, we, don't, we don't form a company so we can get together as people, <laughs> enjoy our time together. We, get, we form a company because we have a task, a challenge, something we're going to do for a customer. It starts with the work. And if as employers, we don't start from there and think about that in the beginning, we're going we're gonna to uh, go off in a funny direction. We don't just come together so we can have some sort of uh, phony sense that we're being a nice employer. It starts with the work, which is hard. So those jobs that Mahesh is providing in Sri Lanka and Haiti, those are going to be, they're not easy jobs. People are going to be working. They're going to be working, you know, full eight hours, 40, hour, 40 hours a week. Then there's the relationship between the company, right? Are we buying and selling time? Or are we actually, as Jim used the words, are, are we taking on the obligation? That some, that some I'm going to make you a member. I have some obligation. You do to be able to give your best work so we can have co-destiny for where we're going to go. But I do as well. And then there are these wonderful, fun processes of engagement, right? How we get people, you know, those are the things you can see that feel really good. What I'd like to do, if we can quickly, we're going to use Slido in a dynamic way. If you can do this. Everybody ready? You got your slide? Can you get your Slido ready? I want you to tell me what are some processes of engagement that you can think of? How we get people involved. I think it was Steve up here that talked about a Kaizen event. Yes, doing Kaizen events, right? That's a way to get people involved. Yeah, if you want to shout it out, that's okay. But I think if, uh, instead of questions, so Kaizen, problem solving. Something, give me something specific. So a, a specific means by which you engage people in Kaizen or problem solving. Daily huddles, good, thank you. I think that's a good example, daily huddles. Anything else that comes to mind? Excuse me? 
I'm sorry, I can't hear very well. Plus delta. What is that? Feedback after every meeting. Maybe do an after action review and then give some sort of feedback. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Provide time in their schedules. Anyone here have something like a, can, give me an example of a disrespectful means of trying to get people engaged. We believe in respect for people. Is there a disrespectful way of doing that? Well, one way might be to do nothing. <laughs> There's no means by which we make it possible for people to be really engaged in their work. What about suggestion boxes? Who has like a suggestion system in your company, a means by which people can give a suggestion? Hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. Who, you know, suggestion box, suggestion system. All right, I'm going to have to test this. Who does not have any means of suggestion box or suggestion system in your company? Okay, 60% of the people did, you know, come. One more time. How many people have some means by which someone can give a suggestion, like a suggestion box? Okay, more hands went up. Okay, so that's probably better than, better than nothing, right? What if you have suggestion boxes, but you don't act on the suggestions? Which is worse? Having no suggestion box or a suggestion box where it just goes in there and never comes out? The latter, right? So a kind of a fake process of, of engagement that you can write in your brochure, you know, when people are going to come and, inter and interview for a job, you can say, we have this. Or QC circles. How many people were involved in some sort of quality circle, quality circle uh, activity probably a couple of decades ago? <laughs> a couple of decades ago and probably not recently, right? Why is that? Because those were all events whereby people would gather together, sit around in a circle and say, do you have any ideas of, what, of how things could be better here? Oh, yes, let's move the soft drink machines closer to the work site. Not really getting at the core matter. Right? And so the, all those died away. They, they, the, most of those don't even exist in companies anymore. Go and see together. Sure, start with why. So these are techniques. These are ways that we can work with Empower them to solve their problems. Now you're, now you're getting to something that's really core that we want, right? Then the question is, how do we do that? All right, let's go to the next one, okay? Those are some kind of means that you, a specific means of engaging people in their work, like a process of engagement. What about in the middle of it, the relationship? The relationship itself. Jim mentioned the obligation, right? That as employers, do we, should we not choose to feel that we have an obligation for the folks that we uh, bring and who spend 40 hours a week with us? It's a choice, you know, you don't have to. What's an example of some example? So the relationship means the pay, right? That's one part of it. I have a contract. We have some pay. We have benefits. What are some examples of some maybe disrespectful ways of having a relationship? More than, more respect. Hold people, leadership accountable. Now, that was an example of what? I'm not sure now. Sharing jobs, that's a good way to, to engage people, I think, Humble inquiry is, a, is certainly a good way for us to be able to deal with the employees. Recognize and reinforce the right behaviors. Any thoughts around the relationship between the individual and the company? Is there a way that we can do that that is more respectful versus less respectful? At any rate, I think thinking about that and deciding how we think about that is an important thing for us as employees. What is the basic fundamental relationship that we have? I think that strikes to the questions that Jim was discussing with the panel here. And then the next one, okay, the work itself. What's a respectful way that we can think about providing work to people? Not the job, okay, not the pay, but the work itself. That's why people join us. That's why we bring people into the organization. What's a respectful versus disrespectful way to do that? So I'm going to share with you some, some thoughts that I put down. And again, these materials are available to you. Um, and also, they're a draft. They're a draft. We work through these ideas together with the community. So some processes of engagement are, you know, empowerment programs. People used to do empowerment training. Initiatives to invite participation. Suggestion systems, quality circles, Kaizen events, empowerment training. And for a long time now, we were 100 years, we've had efforts to humanize the workplace. It's something they used to call job enhancement. Uh, human relations, going back to the 1930s at least. So finding ways that people, as they go to work, can be fully engaged and bring their creativity, their thinking to their work. And if we go from there into this idea of a relationship, the employer-employee relationship. So first of all, that begins with the employment conditions. We're talking about it a lot of times in retail. 
the, the gig economy. Okay, people uh, don't have work enough hours to be able to have uh, benefits. Okay, I mean that's one way. That's, that that is that is a way to have a relationship between an employer and employee. A lot of times, the basic idea of what a relationship is between an employer and employee is simply buying and selling time. You have uh, some time, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and I have some money. It's a simple transaction. Another way to think of it, though, is almost like citizenship, true membership in the organization. Now, as Jim pointed out, you know, okay, there is no guarantee for lifetime employment. Any company or employer that tries to say that I'm going to guarantee you lifetime employment, you know, they're saying something they can't see. They can't say because an organization may not be here next year. We may go out of business. But just because I can't guarantee your lifetime, you lifetime employment does not mean I can't say I don't want to lose you ever off. I want you to find that this is the best place you could work, that I'm going to invest in you, as Mahesh talked about investing in his people, so that you can continually develop, develop yourself. And as you develop yourself, the organization is going to be better off as well. I'll introduce you to another book. Another book. Uh, one is uh, Zainet Tan's book on good jobs, which uh, Jim mentioned earlier. Another is Edgar Schein's latest book, on uh, uh, where he starts talk, where he talks about uh, relationships, and he has a typology he introduces of different types of relationships at work. He calls type one, type two, type three. Type one is purely transactional. During the break, I couldn't, or before the break, we couldn't find any coffee, so we went down to uh, Dunkin' Donuts to get some coffee. Took a while, by the way. <laughs> Anyone here, may, you know, before the day's over, you might go uh, see if you could provide a little help. <laughs> but that was a pure transaction. You know, I needed a cup of coffee. I gave a couple of bucks. I got a cup of coffee. It was worth about what I gave for it, a couple of bucks, uh, maybe. Type three, then, is much more intimate, family, friends, close friends. And then type two is something that Edgar advocates that we need to know something. Think of Ernie's conversation yesterday of how his boss, mentor, Challenged him to learn something about all of his employees, and he had 365 of them. And Ernie said, I can't do that, and he did. This is what this means, type something that's more than just purely transactional. This starts to get into this obligatory relationship that Jim was talking about. Now, that's a choice, okay? You can choose to be a different kind of employer. That's okay, but be clear of what kind of employer you want to be. And then the work. I think it's working starts and ends here. So work that's safe, okay, physically and psychologically. It may sound obviously obvious, but we don't often put the effort in to make sure we design work that is safe physically and psychologically. Uh, value creating, content is high. This gets into the lean stuff that we usually like, right? The value content is high, the waste is low, and success is achievable. And respect is designed into the work, not as something we say in a slogan or an HR thing only or the process, a process of engagement. It's designed into the work. The work then, by having a higher value creating content, it is therefore meaningful. Wasting someone's time means you're giving them work that is not meaningful. How can they possibly find that fulfilling? How can they get engaged and then develop themselves and become a thinking problem solver? So the shift there goes from then just from, from accountability for tasks that are assigned, that's a compliance culture, okay, to responsibility for the outcome. Here's what I want you to achieve. I want you to put one of these together every two minutes, okay? The task to do that, I, we know about the best practices so far, but your job, your job is to do that and figure out a better way to do it. Instead of two minutes, how about a minute and a half, okay? So then you can own that outcome. That could even happen in the most menial of jobs, making a cup of coffee, working on an assembly line, which is usually thought as the most demeaning, menial job. No, that can be main, made meaningful. So all that adds up into something that is a work experience. So if, what if we thought of ourselves as designers of a work experience that has the work fundamentally at the foundation? Then the relationship between us as the employer and the employee, and then the specific means by which people can get involved in things like Kaizen and, and, and problem solving. All that adds up to a work experience. Think of us as designers of work experiences. So we use this uh, house here. I'm not going to go through this a whole lot right now, but the framework is designed around questions point there is that they're questions of things for each of us to ask, not things to do. We're not, again, we're trying to avoid this whole task compliance thing, right? So where does our theme of being a better employer fit? You know, how does it fit with developing uh, capability? I think that came out a lot these last couple of days, right? right? Lean thinking says, well, we want to develop people. Uh, what does it say about the management system and behaviors that we need? Well, think about Mahesh. 
with that much responsibility, that many employees, close to 100,000, and he's spending half a day walking a single gimbal. What's our basic thinking? You know, I'm not going to say, we mentioned it yesterday, that a company has to look at things this way. If I'm going to be an employer, make a company, you can look at it however you want. But if we look at this from a lean thinking standpoint, where we're trying to, where we're trying to create organizations that truly create value and make the world a better place, then no, we have, there, there are implications to the decisions that we make and the way we think about these things. And often it, press, it strikes me that we nowadays don't spend quite enough time thinking about the design of the work itself, because that's why we come together every day, not because we want to be a group of people together, <laughs> because we have some work to do. So this is a uh, visual version of uh, what Jim introduced yesterday, the virtuous, virtuous spiral of being a better employee. So better employment, better employees, we engage and we develop people. The people then will produce better. The company will become more prosperous. That will enable us to provide better conditions. The people, therefore, will stay, and they're going to produce better. And the learning is going to make the organization stronger. So it's a virtuous spiral. And again, all these things are drafts, okay? So, so as you send us uh, your feedback, maybe we can make this better. It's also all open source, okay? You can take this stuff and think about what would this mean in our com company? What kind of terminology might we want to use? I have, what, how many? Six of those things there. You might want seven. You might want five. Make it yours, okay? And here's an example of really taking this, this idea that, that, that I can feel obligated to make the employees better so they can help me make a stronger company. So Toyota put a factory in, in Australia uh, about 25 years ago, and it was successful enough. It wasn't one of Toyota's best globally, actually. And in fact, 10, 15 years ago, it was one of its worst. But it was getting better, and it was getting better. And then a few years ago, General Motors and Ford pulled out of Australia. It's a small market. It never made sense to produce cars in Australia, probably. probably. Sorry, I'm looking at an Australian who's, you know, I, you know I'm glad that you. Um, but what happened is, as they realized that they were going to have to pull out of Australia, Toyota that is, they began a program to upskill, to reskill, an upskilling program, reskilling program. The 75% of the employees took part in, 2,000 of 2,600 employees. The others just decided, okay, I'm ready to retire, you know, or I'll go do something else. They learned new skills so they could get new jobs. Now, Toyota, again, they didn't have to do that. They worked as two years. The, the CEO of Global Toyota, uh, one of the biggest companies, uh, right, in the world, flew there to personally deliver the message to those 2,600 people that we're going to have to shut the doors. So for the Toyota family, it's a humiliating thing to have to do that because they think very carefully, when I hire someone, what that's going to mean next year, five years from now, ten years from now. Again, I'm not going to say to any employer that you have to think of it that way. I am asking you to think of what it does mean. Okay? What is your philosophy? What is your approach? What do you think? So there's a thinking and approach then of the leader that was critical to making this work. So this other topic that's come up several times this last couple of days is the role of the leader. And one of the ways we think of this is there's often an, the old-fashioned command and control dictator. N no one advocates that anymore. <laughs> there's no book that says, yes, you should be command and control dictator, which says, do it my way. Everyone says, no, don't do that. But what to do instead of that is often kind of a, you know, there are a lot of fairly, you know, kind of fuzzy books, I think, and fuzzy, you know, concepts of what to do. And often they end up being in an opposite extreme of some sort of empowerment thing. So they're up there at the top of the pyramid. They, they rest up there. Let's provide ping pong tables for people so they feel good, right? Let's have a great cafeteria so the employees love us. Those are opposite extremes. And I think when we think of what lean leadership is, it's not just meeting in the middle. Of per it's not just a matter of perfect balance. It's a different thing, okay? It's neither of those extremes. And they, those both have flaws that will mean that we can't get where we want to go in most instances. So instead, you know, it's what we often call Follow me and we'll figure this out together or lead as if you have no power. It doesn't mean that you have no power. It doesn't mean that sometimes we have, don't have to take a firm hand. It means getting involved in the work and the details. That's why my head goes to Gemba and, look, and looks at three hours, half a day at a time to truly understand the work. Not doing, as Steve said, I think Steve is, is the one who was sitting in the middle here that said he had a door company and just told everyone, yes, that's great that you're doing Kaizen. Keep doing that. You know, I support you. Without really seeing and understanding the work himself. We believe you need to understand that work in order to be able to design respectful work for people. 
So the fear that of, 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 of uh, what improvement means to employment is an interesting thing. And I'm not sure if this applies to you or not. I used to spend a lot of time in manufacturing where there were unions around, where often people were afraid if, oh, if we improve, we're going to make a lot of our workforce redundant. So we can't do that. We can't do Kaizen. It's going to make our, some of our workforce redundant. And I, I just always scratched my head. No, what, what? that's crazy. It's just the same as being afraid of automation. There's nothing, we don't need to be afraid of automation. It's coming and it's made life better. I don't hear one saying that we should go back to building roads with a pick and a shovel, right? We want to use that and there's still plenty more work to do, plenty more work to do. But here's just a little flow chart we used to use back in the day when I was at Toyota. You have an opportunity to eliminate waste. You can either do that or you don't. <laughs> if you don't, that waste is going to stay there and the costs are going to stay. On the other hand, if you do eliminate that waste, you, then you have a choice to what to do with it, right? You can lay people off. You can save a lot of costs, whatever the Kaizen was, and then also the cost of the people that were there. Okay, those costs are going to go down, but that trust is going to be lost as well. Remember the, 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 the exercise that, uh, that Ernie and Tracy took us through yesterday, folding up the paper? You said trust is, trust is gone. You're not going to easily be able to get it back. So you could, however, do the Kaizen and eliminate you know, a little bit, of, you know, bit of waste, save some money, but you don't worry about the size of your organization. Okay, the trust is going to stay, but the costs are really going to stay as well. Okay. There's another choice, which is we right size gradually. And you don't know. Next year may be a good year. may need to hire back again, right? But you can grow the trust. You can reduce costs over time with the right size organization. No reason to be afraid of Kaizen and the fact that it might make some of the capacity redundant. No reason to be afraid of automation. It's a very good reason, though, to be very thoughtful about it, to understand what our strategy is, what our thinking is. So I don't, the future of work, we don't know where exactly where it's going to go. Uh, we know it's changing already, and it's not going to be exactly the same tomorrow as it is today. Uh, a lot of people are big fans of, uh, of Tesla uh, and uh, Elon Musk, who has done a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, certainly designed a pretty cool product with the, the Model S. It's fun to drive, and you know it's fast, and it's, even though it's a luxury sedan, it's like incredible performance. Uh, and as he's trying to make his new product, you know, the Model 3, uh, as he says, we're going through production hell. He has actually put himself up a cot at the end of the production line where he's out there just making, trying to find ways to make more and more, as many of the Model S as he needs to. Okay? Now, his answer basically has been, has been that he's going to try to automate more and more. Okay? Again, we don't need to be afraid of automation. But what we need to, need to do, though, have, is be very thoughtful about it. What does that mean to the people that are in the organization? What, what, is, what is it going to mean when automation comes in that doesn't really work the way we thought it was going to work? But I don't think this is going to go away in my lifetime, uh, probably the lifetime of anyone here, that what we want to do is build stronger organizations. And organizations are still going to have people that are part of that, at least for a while, right? <laughs> I think for a very, very long time. And as we think about developing people as a core principle, doing that through the work itself, not as an add-on, how we design the work and engage people in improving it, being the key insight that can enable us to create a truly learning organization that can sustain for the long term, develop people through getting the work done. Uh, as uh, Elon said, uh, we're going through production hell. I'm going to change pace here just a little bit. And uh, today, Tabitha thanked the staff that people have worked really hard. And I, I've, always, I've always felt a little bit funny sometimes about standing up and thinking, you, you know, it's, it, it, it's us. So that we, sh we shouldn't thank ourselves for working hard. You should thank us if you actually think it was worthwhile. Having said that, it is a lot of work putting these things on. And recently, I think it, this probably expresses the, uh, the feeling of some of the staff that we've been going through uh, summit prep hell. A lot of work, a lot of work to, put, to pull all this together. Um, and it's when you see it come together that it can indeed be uh, worthwhile. This is uh, Tyler again. Okay, I don't want to offend anyone, so I kind of blocked it out. But Tyler, uh, who's been around, and you, you, heard, you heard his uh, sense of humor yesterday. So uh, he said that this has been the most event that he's ever been to. <laughs> now you can feel that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, really. really. Thank you, Tyler, and everyone. And with that, uh, I think it's time for me to bring up uh, Tabitha and Josh to take us to the next thing. I think some people may have heard about this guitar that's here and, and what's going to happen with that. So Tabitha and Josh, come up, please. We didn't just make up this idea about giving away guitars, by the way. Our theme was inspired by Ernest Tubb. I told you that. 
This is a newspaper article from 1964 that Ernest Tubb used to give away guitars on the radio. And so what we're, this is an article about a woman who run, won the guitar from him. So we're actually following in a tradition. So with that, I will turn it over to you guys okay. to take us home. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Wow. Yeah. Is it you, really the end of Tuesday? We, are we here? Yeah. We're all still here. Okay. So thank you again for spending the last couple of days with us. We still have one more day left of our program, and that's tomorrow, Wednesday. There are many of you attending a, a bunch of workshops, uh, so hang in there. You've got a great day of learning ahead of you tomorrow as well. Uh, with that, uh, as we close out, uh, as I mentioned earlier today, we are recycling our name badges, and so we are asking you to turn your name badges in and uh, use one of the baskets that you'll find at the registration desk. And as I mentioned, each one of these baskets has a location name on them. And this is our opportunity to hear from you again, and you let us know where you would like to go in 2020. Seattle, Phoenix, New Orleans, Orlando, or Carlsbad? Can I vote? No, because I already know tag? what you would vote for. That's Are you wearing a name tag? You can vote. Yeah, I guess you can. If I but I already my know tag, what you I lost my <laughs> <laughs> um, So, and then again, if you would be so kind to take a few moments, fill out that feedback form. Again, another basket is at that registration desk, so you can drop it off there on your way out. We value, value, value your feedback, and we can't do this without you. So thank you for taking the time in advance. So with that. So Lean 18, I can't thank you guys enough for making uh, Lean 18 actually trend on Twitter three times. So that I mentioned we got to the third spot on the homepage. 700 people did that. That's, that's pretty amazing. So I'd like to bring up the four. Let's bring them on, on stage. So Rich Cavaruso, Monica Ross, oh my gosh. Anderson, <laughs> and Steve Cliff. Are you serious? Guys, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. All right. So we've got mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got two third prize winners, a second prize winner, mm. and a grand prize winner. John is still holding on to that. <laughs> I may not let it go. <laughs> All right. So our third prize winners are Rich Cavaruso and Monica Rossi, and they're going to win. Signed copies of Ernie and Tracy's book. <laughs> okay, right right right. So we're going to cool. skip right over and go to the grand prize from here. The grand prize winner is Jenny Anderson. So. Woo! I'm going to share a glitch. There was actually a slide in between that that had the whole drum roll thing, and I hit it twice. I apologize. But so when I talked with the judges, it, Jenny did something pretty, pretty amazing. We asked for quotes. We asked for pictures. I, I can't do it justice with a, a still frame. But she actually got John Chuck to give her a guitar lesson on stage at the summit. And put she it was on very video. pushy about it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, if you would like to present the guitar, I know it's going to hurt. It's gonna hurt it a little. Gonna, it is gonna hurt, but actually, no, it's it's great. Here you go. We're gonna oh. put it, put it, put it, put it on, put it on, put it on, <laughs> put it on. There it is. There it is. <laughs> but, I have to teach me how to play again. Uh, another, <laughs> another lesson. All right, Steve, you got the second prize. Okay. One second more prize is still pretty darn good. I think it's really good. Tab, they'll do the honors. Uh, yeah. I know what's up. So I would like you to take the microphone. Go That's ahead. Sick. Actually, you do. If you can sing, you have that, to sing, and then uh, we'll get bonus points. You can sing to everyone and let them know what is on this paper. You really want me to sing? I was prepared I do. to sing. Go, go ahead, <laughs> go for it. You can do it with this microphone if you want to. Actually. This is <laughs> good. <laughs> Please. One free registration to the 2019 Lean Transformation Summit in Come Houston, on. Texas. Whoa. Woo! Yes.
It also says my boss has to buy me a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, yes, we will be in Houston, Texas next year. Uh, it will be a four-day program, March 25th through the 28th. Be sure to mark your calendars. Uh, we'll have a mixture of workshops and a two-day event. So please join us. And thank you again for being here in Nashville. We are really Thank grateful you all. for yes. everything yes. you've done. Thank you.